White and Blue Niles, a travel post written and narrated by Robert Fairhead from the Tall and True Writer's website. In 1987, my wife and I shouldered our backpacks and set off from Australia. The plan was to live and work overseas in England for two years, using it as a base for UK and wider world travels. And the widest of these were inspired by reading books like Alan Moorhead's The White Nile and The Blue Nile. With the benefit of 2020's hindsight, Moorhead's books are products of their time, as underscored by the blurb on the covers. The White Nile. The amazing story of the explorers and conquerors of the most mysterious region on Earth. The Blue Nile. The cruelty and splendour of Africa and the men who conquered it. Both titles were published in the early 1960s, when parts of Africa were still under colonial rule. Back then, the Dark Continent seemed as vast and impenetrable as Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness and as teeming with wildlife as Ernest Hemingway's Green Hills of Africa. I bought the Nile books from a second-hand bookshop or market in Brighton, where I lived on the south coast of England. Their princely prices, written in pencil on the inside covers, were 65 pence and one pound. Back then, I was drawn to travel writing and tales of heroic exploration because I saw myself as a traveller, not a tourist. I wanted to travel and write like the travel writers whose books I read. My favourite travel writers included Eric Newby, Paul Thoreau, Bill Bryson, and Dervla Murphy. I also regularly read travel pieces in the Guardian newspaper. Through my reading and cross-references, I learned of Moorhead's Nile classics. In addition to chronicling the quest for the twin sources of the Nile, the books contain first-hand accounts of other epic expeditions on the continent, and the White Nile includes one of the world's most famous meetings. I walked up to him, took off my hat, and said, Dr Livingston, I presume. Yes, he said, with a kind smile, lifting his cap slightly. I replaced my hat on my head, and he replaced his cap, and we both grasped hands. And then I said, I thank God, Doctor, I have been permitted to see you. He answered, I feel thankful that I am here to welcome you. There are no prizes for guessing who doffed his hat to Dr Livingston. The Nile books also provided an historical framework for the conquest and colonisation of Africa. In a preface note to the reader in the Blue Nile, Moorhead wrote, This book, together with the White Nile, which has already been published, completes a study of the river in the 19th century. It is intended that the two books, though complementing one another, should be read quite separately. The White Nile dealt with the years between 1856 and 1900, here I have stepped back half a century to 1798 and am concerned with the events on the Blue Nile and on the mainstream that descends from Ethiopia through the Sudan and Egypt to the sea. However, the keenest interest for colonial explorers and modern day readers was in the source of the Niles. The shorter Blue Nile originates at Lake Tana in Ethiopia. The Scottish explorer James Bruce claimed to be the first European to see its source in 1770, but this is disputed. With credible reports, the Spanish Jesuit Pedro Paez reached Lake Tana in 1618. The longer White Nile proved far more challenging to explore. It originates at Lake Victoria in Uganda. The first European to cite its source, the British explorer John Hanning Speak, didn't do so until 1858. Speak also named the vast lake in honour of Queen Victoria. But, like Bruce and the Blue Nile, this claim was disputed, principally by Speak's partner in the expedition, Richard Francis Burton. Fittingly, Henry Morton Stanley, who famously presumed he'd met Livingston, proved Speak's claim by circumnavigating Lake Victoria in 1876. <coughs> Instead of staying overseas for two years as planned, my wife and I lived in England from 1987 to 1995. We returned to Australia in 1996 after a nine-month overland adventure inspired by travel writers and Michael Palin's Pole to Pole TV series. First we headed east to Finland and then turned and travelled south until we reached Zimbabwe by train, boat, bus, truck and even bicycle. In Africa, our route took us along the Nile in Egypt from Cairo to Aswan. We crisscrossed the Blue Nile in Ethiopia and visited its source at Lake Tana. 
And finally, we caught a ferry from Kampala to an island on the source of the White Nile in Uganda, Lake Victoria. As we stared in awe at the Nile rivers and their sources, I thought of my second-hand copies of the White Nile and the Blue Nile. Yes, Alan Moorhead's books were products of their time, but after reading them, I travelled more widely than I'd imagined when I left Australia. Upon reflection, the Nile books also led me to see the world differently from how Moorhead depicted it in the 1960s and from how I thought of it as a backpacking traveller in the 1980s and 1990s. Hi, I'm Robert Fairhead from Tall and True Short Reads and the Tall and True Writer's website. I wrote this travel post in February 2021. Earlier that month, a friend mentioned Alan Moorhead's White and Blue Nile books on social media, and we exchanged photos of our yellowed paperback copies. Dusting off the books from my bookcase, I recalled how much they had meant to me in my early backpacking days and decided to pay homage to the White and Blue Niles on Tall and True. Moorhead's books are of their time. The quoted cover blurbs are proof of that. But they're also detailed historical accounts of life along the rivers, the clashes with European colonisers, and ultimately, the search for the source of the White and Blue Niles. As a young wannabe traveller and travel writer, I found them inspirational. And as our modern times prove, we must learn from history to stop repeating its mistakes. I hope you enjoyed this reflective travel post. You can read all my posts, selected short stories and other writings on tallandtrue.com. You can also buy my short stories and microfiction collections from the Amazon Kindle, Apple Books and Kobo online bookstores. Links are available in the show notes. The next episode of Tall and True Short Reads will be released shortly. In the meantime, please check your feed or the podcast website, tallandtrueshortreads.com, for earlier episodes from all four seasons. And follow or subscribe to the podcast and rate and review it by your favourite app. Doing so helps share my storytelling. You can support the podcast financially by making a small one-off or regular donation via the ACAST supporter page. There's a link in the show notes. Finally, please share this episode with family and friends and tell them about the stories and posts on Tall and True Short Reads and the Tall and True Writer's Website. <laughs>